Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Today's episode, I think, is so important for anyone dealing with cancer or who has a loved one dealing with cancer or just wants to prevent cancer from ever entering their life. Uh, This is a very informative, powerful, and inspiring conversation. I got to interview Dr. Nalini Chilkov, who is the founder of IntegrativeCancerAnswers.com and the author of the best-selling book, 32 Ways to Outsmart Cancer how to create a body in which cancer cannot thrive. Dr. Nalini's Outsmart Cancer Programs are recognized as the most comprehensive, science-based, safe, natural programs for supporting cancer patients, cancer survivors, and those who do not want to get cancer at all. So we cover so much. I would definitely get out your pen and your notepad because she goes into some of the supplements and the superfoods that we should all be taking to prevent cancer, to create the terrain in our body in which cancer cannot thrive. Uh, Lots to cover, but so informative and helpful. So let's just dive in with Dr. Nalini Chilkov. All right, Dr. Chilkov, thank you so much for coming today. Um, Can you just start by telling the listeners a little bit about your background and how you came to do the integrative cancer work that you do today. Well, you know, everyone has a personal story. Yeah. So my parents, both of them were diagnosed in their 50s with cancer. And so I got interested from a very personal point of view, thinking that our family must have some genetic vulnerability to cancer because both my parents or we were all exposed to toxins unknowingly and so I started because I want to save my parents lives right and they weren't particularly interested (laughs) but and what I was interested in natural medicine but they both lived to 88 and 90 and so although they had cancer in the middle of their lives they didn't die of cancer and so that also was a teaching for me because I understood that cancer doesn't mean you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a loaded word and a lot of people think that it is. So I was already practicing Chinese medicine and naturopathic medicine and I had been a nurse so I put everything together and I, you know, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And so people would come to me who were either at risk or in the middle of cancer treatment or having a recurrence. And it forced me into the trenches, really. And I love complexity and I love being on the edge with people who are, are ripe for transformation and healing. And so I just took a deep dive and I really studied for, um, you know, 10, 15 years to try and gain some sense of mastery over what cancer is really about and what it takes to transform someone with cancer into a healthy person. Mm, Gosh, I mean, what is cancer all about? Talk about a complex Mm -hmm. disease because there's Mm -hmm. so many different types and so many different causes. Um, So we'll get into kind of the work you do, but not a day goes by that I don't hear of someone new being diagnosed with cancer. I mean, back when your parents were 50, you know, you maybe have one person you know have cancer. It was rare. So it was shocking that you had two. So of course you'd go to genetics or environment. Um, But I mean, today it's like, it's a pandemic to, you know, it's like crazy. So what do you attribute the rising cancer to? So the statistics are pretty awesome. There's one in two people in the United States now that's crazy will be diagnosed with some type of cancer in their lifetime so if you're sitting at a dinner party with eight people four of them right it's 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 pretty sobering Shocking. right yeah pretty sobering so when i'm asked that question there's really one answer to it that's an umbrella for this dilemma we're in and that it's a perfect storm between our genetic vulnerabilities and our toxic environment 
You know, we're not biologically designed for the environment we live in. And so people who are developing cancer in this environment are sort of like the canaries in the mine. They're the people whose genetics really can't adapt to the environment we are all in. And so I do look at genetics and genomics, which is the next step out from your DNA, to see where those patterns are. And so one of the things I see is that people who are really inefficient detoxifiers are much more vulnerable to cancer and then to cancer treatments, right? To, yeah, exactly. To toxic cancer treatments. So uh, we can leverage our understanding to more individualized treatment when we understand more about the biosystem that's hosting the cancer. So the question is, why is one person's body hospitable and supportive of cancer development and progression, and why is somebody else in that very same environment not? Yeah, and what's the answer to that? <laughs> well, you know, it's complex, yeah. like cancer, is, everything's multifactorial. We'd yeah. all love to have one handhold we can grab onto and say that's the answer. Yeah. Um, but there's so many layers to it. One of the things we have to understand, the type of cancer a person has, what kind of animal is that? Is it a lazy, slow-growing kind of cancer? Or is it something caused by a virus? Or is it something really aggressive like wildfire? There's you know different personalities to, to cancers. There's many, many cancers. Even if you just talk about breast cancer, you know, there's many types. So if you understand the, the kind of cancer someone has, that helps you treat them better. But you also have to understand the biosystem that they are, and you have to understand the larger environment that that's all arising in. So what oncology doesn't really tend to is to understand the individual biosystem, right? And so that's where we can make a big difference because like the soil in a garden, if you change the soil, you change what grows there. We don't want weeds, we want beautiful flowers and fruits. Right? Juicy tomatoes, right? Yeah. right? So understanding the ground, the terrain, the cancer terrain helps us to then understand why someone is hosting cancer in their system. It's a signaling environment. So for example, why it matters what you eat is because all the phytochemicals in food or in herbal medicines are actually talking to your genes and turning your genes off and on. And we can think about, could we turn off cancer promoter genes? And can we turn on cancer suppressor genes? Yes, we can. And so, you know, we look at all the angles, all those signaling pathways. So when I put a plan together for a patient, I'm like imagining a wheel with many spokes. And every spoke on that wheel is something that has to be addressed in the, the plan to have a cohesive, comprehensive approach. So the oncologist might pick one spoke on the wheel, like hormonal therapy, and that's not enough. Mm -hmm. That's not enough because cancer is too complex. And then you have to have a health model. The word health isn't even in the lexicon in an oncology clinic. It doesn't even come up. It's like not even the goal. And so what do patients want? Patients want health. And so you have to put all those pieces together. And so it's a journey. It's, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And so what is your like certification and background because you I mean what what is your title what do you call yourself well I um I feel like we need more of you <laughs> yeah so my in California I am a, a doctor of oriental medicine and acupuncture which allows me to be a primary care provider okay and so that's not true in all states but I can practice independently of physicians and write lab orders and and treat patients independently, not under anyone's supervision. And so I've been in private practice for almost 35 years. Nice. And about 20 of those doing cancer. And before that, I my degree was in cell biology and I did some nursing. So I actually put together the sort of traditional wisdom and healing traditions with modern science. And when I first went to school, we didn't even have the science on herbs and supplements, but now we do. So I can say to a, an oncologist, well, I have a phytochemical that can actually turn off that cancer pathway that you're looking for a drug for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Know, right. And so it just takes something like curcumin, which is uh, widely known 
to be important in cancer ecology? And why is curcumin, which comes from the turmeric root, uh, why is that important? Because it interacts with over a hundred different receptors and genes. And you can take it safely for your whole life. And if there was a drug like that, it would be a blockbuster yeah. drug, right? Yeah. But we don't have things like that in, in drug therapies. And so it's a beautiful marriage. You know, curcumin actually is synergistic with some chemotherapy agents. Mm. So I'm not anti anything. I, I'm not a, a sort of an ideologue. I'm a pragmatist. When a patient comes in, I say, what's the right tool for the job over all the tools mm -hmm. we have, right? And, and sometimes uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy or surgery are going to give us the goal of a long life, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to have the cancer conversation more than once. Mm -hmm. And so when a person comes in and says, I'm only doing natural, that's all I'm doing, I say, well, let's see, you're in your 30s, you have a two-year-old, and I'd really like you to see your grandchildren. Do you want that? Yeah. You know, and so certain cancers, we understand how to treat them, and we can use some of the therapies that in conventional oncology, it's not the enemy, you know? Yeah. You have to know how to use any tool. Yes, right? and that's, you know, I love the wheel and the spoke because, yeah, chemo is one quote-unquote weapon. Right, but you need a whole arsenal and you have to treat the patient holistically yes. and take into account emotional, yes. mental, spiritual, yes. and the yes. fact that you're putting chemo, it's, it's gonna affect healthy tissues and tumor to, you know, as well. So you have to make sure that you protect the health in, in, in how do you say, um, encourage health and thriving. And Absolutely, so, you know, we leverage the fact that tumor cells are markedly different than healthy cells which is why you can give somebody chemo and they don't die mm -hmm. from the chemo is because the tumor cells are much more vulnerable. And so okay. a, lot of, a lot of patients feel like the treatment is the enemy, but cancer is the enemy. Chemo won't kill you, cancer will kill you. And so it's really important to understand that you could just be open and maybe have a better solution. And now that I've been in practice 35 years, I have to say at the beginning I was, don't do any of those therapies, they're too toxic. And what I've actually seen is that if you have a complex cancer, putting the best of both worlds together is often what's gonna give you the better solution. And that's a lot of people who try to do it 100% naturally often recur or die. Mm -hmm. And I wish that wasn't true. I wish I wasn't saying that. Mm -hmm. But but for some patients, if you have a lot of tumor burden, there aren't equivalents in natural medicine. And we don't have time. We're the slow action of, of natural medicine for all patients. So each person has to be really examined and have an individual plan. Individualized medicine, no matter what your diagnosis, is how you get to the best outcome. Yes, you know? exactly. Custom fit for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the same goes the other way. Most people who just bombard their system with Western and don't change any of the right, environment, right, right, whether it's mental right. and physical and diet and lifestyle that created this cancer terrain, right. it will probably recur That's as right. well. So it's almost necessary to have a full overhaul and use a blend depending on what stage and well, what type. I ask my patients to do really hard things all the time. And so I actually vet who I accept as a patient because if you want to have an, accept, an exceptional outcome and not be part of the bell curve of expected <laughs> progression or, or uh, you know, your risk of recurrence, if you don't want to be in those statistics, then you do have to transform. And as you know, healing is transformation. And so I vet my patients because I tell them I'm going to ask you to do hard things. I'm going to ask you to engage in self-reflection and self-inquiry. I'm going to ask you to change your lifestyle and your diet and maybe some of your relationships and habits. And so if someone is resistant to that, I say, think about it. Maybe you'll come back later. And some people do, mm -hmm. you know. And so I accept certain people into my practice whom I feel are a good fit for what I'm going to ask of them. And therefore, I have a lot of successful cases, but you have to really understand what it takes, yeah. you know, what it really takes. 
And it takes an all-in mentality, as we were talking about, yeah, and our yeah. mutual friend yeah. Stacy has that yeah. all-in mentality. Yeah. Um, what, you know, you, you put together the resource of the integrativecanceranswers.com. You have a lot of information there. But how do we, do you have any ideas on how to, like, for someone that is listening and says, well, I can't afford Dr. N- Nalini, what do I do? What are my options? There are so many things you can do, even if you don't have a lot of money. Anybody can eat healthy, fresh food, <laughs> right? Anybody can exercise, get enough sleep. What are the basics? Like, what causes health is really uh, uh, the core question. And that applies to many chronic illnesses, not just cancer. But, you know, you want you can set up your life so you walk through each room in your house and see what kind of cleaning supplies you have or body care products you have and are they toxic and should you be putting those things on your skin or inhaling them? And so you can walk through your house and start in your kitchen and your bathroom and your bedroom and your garden and your laundry room and, and have your environment not have toxic chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. You can start there. And so it's just a learning process. I love the website, Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, because it's a place to learn if you're not aware of where where toxic chemicals come from and you're looking for a sunscreen for your kid so you can go on that site and find one that isn't toxic right and you're looking for a new shampoo for yourself so that you don't have one filled with chemicals that are carcinogenic like parabens Mm -hmm. and so that's a great site if you're beginning to learn about all of this and you can learn about which foods tend to harbor pesticides and insecticides more than others and you can find out where you can shop at a farmer's market or where is there a store where you can get clean food and really learn about how to feed yourself and it's really simple in my book 32 ways to outsmart cancer that's what I have I have 32 tips that are simple that anybody can do yeah. right that anybody can do uh, getting sleep is crucial to immunity it is crucial (laughs) and we're a culture that is so neurotic about being proud that you only need four hours of sleep which is everyone needs seven to nine hours of sleep to have a healthy immune system and a healthy brain and so anybody can do that anybody can get 30 minutes of exercise every day you just have to walk you don't need to be macho you know and so these lifestyle changes actually have more impact than any drug yeah you know? so anybody can do that and then you can learn like what are the anti-cancer superfoods so that you eat those every day so think about the garlic and onion family think about the broccoli and cabbage family those foods have phytochemicals in them that are potent in interrupting cancer development at every stage of development you can just fill your diet with a rainbow of colors because each one of those plant pigments actually is a phytochemical that turns genes on and off. So that's why it matters what you eat because you can turn genes on that suppress cancer and turn genes off that promote cancer by what you eat, by if you sleep, by managing your peace of mind and your stress. Mm -hmm. You can learn self-regulation. And so anybody can do those things, absolutely anybody. I agree. Um, and and again, they can go order. You know, book. These are small investments yeah. you can make yeah. that then last give you yeah. this foundation and, and resources. Learn to meditate or other. Yes. You know, connect with nature, yes. earth. All of these techniques that yes. just take our own body mm-hmm. and and a just different mindset. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's so much conflicting information out there. What is your latest outsmart cancer um, diet? Or is it one? Is is no, there, does it if vary? We understand the physiology of of cancer cells, then we can also leverage what's unique about cancer cells and change the diet to starve the cancer cells and stress the cancer cells mm. and promote the healthy cells to be robust. So, cancer cells are uniquely dependent on sugar. Mm. And so a lot of people think sugar drives cancer, but it's actually insulin that drives cancer. So every time you eat a carbohydrate, whether that's a sweet, a fruit, a sugar, a grain, a bread, a pasta, anytime you eat a carbohydrate, the hormone insulin is triggered because insulin's job is to 
take the blood sugar and open the door of the cell so the sugar could go inside the cell and be used for fuel and energy. So cancer cells have more receptors on their surface and certain cancers are more sensitive to sugar and insulin than others like breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, brain cancer are exquisitely sensitive to insulin and blood sugar. So if you eat a diet that keeps your blood sugar and your insulin in the lowest quarter of normal, say uh, between 70 and 80, that is a way to stress tumor cells. So let's say you went through cancer treatment and you were told you have no evidence of disease, you're in remission, but what we know after treatment is there are microscopic cells left and there are some stem cells, cancer stem cells left. And so what where oncology fails is they fail to tell the patient that mm -hmm. because they don't know what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. Right? And so cancer patients leave treatment and sort of everybody's hoping they're not going to have a recurrence. But almost everyone is at risk for recurrence because of these microscopic cells. So if you create a body where cancer cannot thrive, then those cells aren't going to do anything. Yeah. And so you need to change the environment of those cells. So diet is a potent way to do that. Uh, avoiding toxic carcinogenic chemicals is a way to do that. So by eating the rainbow, which we just mentioned, you're getting a multiplicity of phytochemicals which change the signals. And that's like right? green broccoli, red peppers, blueberries. Is that what you're talking about? Color. Like, yeah. Lots of color. Oranges, Carrots, lemons. Carrots, right. Yeah. Just eat color. Right? Oh, no, not fruit. Well, it depends on the patient. Like if someone has a sugar-dependent, insulin-dependent type of cancer, but they have a low tumor burden or they are... Um, very thin, they don't have diabetes risk in their family. There's wiggle room, so I'll say eat, limit your fruit to a cup of organic berries a day. Mm -hmm. And you think about the sweetness on your tongue, and that'll tell you how glycemic or how sugary a food is. It's not rocket science, you know? You don't need to measure it. If you put a banana on your tongue, it is a lot more sweet than putting a blueberry on your tongue mm -hmm. and, or putting an avocado on your tongue. So you can tell a about how food's gonna affect your blood sugar by tasting it, right? Mm -hmm. So our bodies are such reliable feedback mechanisms, but we have to listen, right? We're so disconnected. Mm -hmm. And so listening to your body is part of having health, right? You need to know if you're hungry, if you're thirsty, if you're tired, right? Yeah. If you and get so, a headache after yeah, eating certain right. foods. So. Right, exactly. So, um, so we do like to eat a low carb diet and there's an enormous amount of research on low carbohydrate diets combined with intermittent fasting being profoundly powerful in reducing recurrence. Mm. Have you seen or are you aware, um, so my friend just went through chemo and, and all the things um, and as well as herbs and supplements and, and you know some lifestyle changes to heal um, colorectal stage four cancer. Yeah. No evidence of disease, and then recently had a seizure, and now she has lesions on her brain. Mm -hmm. I don't know the, quite the extent yeah. of that. Yeah. But um, I, another friend had a different cancer that c came back as a different cancer. Yeah. Is there a chance that the new cancer is a result of the chemo, the treatment? Yes. <laughs> so, so what's true is if you have aggressive treatment like chemotherapy, some of the cancer cells are so smart that they figure out how to survive, and we call those chemo-resistant cells. Mm. So, you know, you'll get a scan or look at your tumor markers as you go through treatment, and your oncologist might tell you, you know, you're you're in remission, but in fact there are these resistant cells. Anytime you have an aggressive therapy, cancer cells are really smart, which makes it difficult to treat. Mm -hmm. But also, if you're diagnosed with a lot of tumor burden, then you actually don't have one kind of cancer cell. You have a really diverse population of tumor cells, and so that makes it complicated to treat also, mm -hmm. which is why if you have chemo, you get a cocktail of more than one agent to try and hit those different types of cells, but that's also why it's useful to include herbal medicines, 
specific supplements so that we fill in the gaps. Like uh, oncologists, because their toolbox is so toxic, Mm -hmm. they could do a little something, you know? But we can, if we think about a wheel with many spokes and all the complexity, all the complexity and all the factors, then we could fill in the gaps on that wheel of what the oncologist isn't doing, like managing your blood sugar, managing inflammation, optimizing your vitamin D, making sure you don't have excess copper, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can do the things that the oncologist isn't doing, or uh, almost all cancers create excessive blood clotting. 40% of all cancer patients have a blood clot. Wow. And and can die of a blood clot instead of their cancer. Oh, I did not and know that. so a lot of people don't know that. So I monitor the blood clotting levels in my patients and I will give herbs and supplements that keep the blood from clotting excessively. But if a patient actually develops extreme risk of, of a blood clot and a, a, a a blood clot can give you what's called a pulmonary embolism, mm-hmm. which can block your airways and you die of a, a stroke in your lungs, essentially. You could have a brain stroke, you can have a heart attack. So that's a blood, that's what a blood clot does. Yeah. And so that's not anything a cancer patient should also experience. Yeah. So you can eat a diet that is less prone to sticky, clotty blood. You can make sure you're hydrated so your blood is not so thick you can get up and move every hour right there's lots of things you can do not to have that happen and what i've done often i have more contact with the patient than the oncologist does and so i'm observing them more closely and i had a patient come in one time who had a chain of blood clots above her port in her arm which was high risk right but the oncologist saw the patient infrequently. I saw the patient frequently because I was doing acupuncture every week. So I, in front of the patient, on my cell phone, I call the oncologist and say, I have your patient and she has a chain of blood clots. She needs to be anticoagulated. So sometimes I'm the person that informs the oncologist that there's a risk and then we can avert it and mm-hmm. intervene early. So you need a team. Yes. If you have cancer, you need a team. You need to be watch closely. If you have an oncologist, usually the oncology nurse is your ally. Mm-hmm. And and at least in California, the oncology nurses and the oncologists are accustomed to patients wanting to have an integrative approach and very open to it. And because I've been in practice for 35 years, I have lots of relationships with oncologists who have seen that it makes a difference. And I get lots of referrals from oncologists for patients who want to engage a health model. So it's very important to not just have a plan for your disease, you need a disease expert for that, but you need a plan for your health. Mm. So I'm the health expert, one of on the team, and I also say to patients because Oncology is so disenfranchising to the patient. It's so disempowering. I often say to patients, you need a team, but you're the head of the team. Mm. You are the head of the team. We all work for you. And nobody can do anything to you or your body or tell you to show up on a certain day if you don't want to. It's your choice. And my goal in my first visit with patients just decrease their anxiety and give them back their power. Empowerment, right? yeah. Because that's what produces a lot of the anxiety is somebody just told me next week I'm starting chemo and I'm not ready to do that, right? Yeah. Or my oncologist has spoke to me like I'm a stupid child. Well, then that's the wrong doctor for right. anybody. Yes. Right? No one has any business talking to another person that way. Especially right? in that situation. Yeah, when you're so yeah. vulnerable. Exactly. Right? And so I think it's really important. The other thing I say is if you're diagnosed with cancer, it's cancer's not urgent care. Cancer's not an emergency. Cancer is a chronic illness. And it took 10 or 20 years to develop a tumor. When you find it, it's been there 10 or 20 years. And so if you take another two or three weeks to take a breath, get a second or third opinion, make sure you have the right doctor, make sure you have your health plan in place, make sure you're, you got a circle of support around you. If you need to get your kids covered, you need to get your business covered, you just need your psyche to catch up yeah. with what just Do a happened, little grieving, right? exactly. Right. Then I tell people, you can take time. You don't have to start next week. It won't make or break your outcome. 
Yeah, and that's so that. important. It's yeah. so important because there is an urgency to oncology, yeah. Yeah. especially yeah. if it's a stage three or four. And, you know, they just want to funnel you into the system and they say, you know, just keep the calories on, eat whatever you can yeah. eat, yeah. you know, which is hand you a bag of M&M's yes. or a yes. hospital burger. And it's not in your high. Again, it's a sick, it's a disease specialized right. model. Right. Um, right. So whether they can work with you, you know, in the flesh or they can just get the resources to be their own advocate and, you know, surround themselves with the social support and the love. Um, it's just so essential. It makes a huge difference. It's very interesting, you know, practicing in Los Angeles, which is multicultural, is a unique experience because uh, some cultures don't like to tell the patient how sick they are. And I think patients have a right to know what's happening to them or if they're near death. But some cultures, they don't feel that that's a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, in Latin culture, the entire family comes to every visit. Yeah. And so I have to pull more chairs in the room. <laughs> and so those patients do so much better. And then I see people who have no support system. They're single, they live alone, they don't, they're in a city, they don't have a lot of friends, and they go through it by themselves, mm. you know? So we know that we're social animals. And so being in a support group, even if it's an online group, makes a difference mm -hmm. to your stress hormones and your sense of belonging and your sense of not being alone going through something like this. So a lot of patients who are very independent, self-sufficient people, their learning curve is to ask for and receive help. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's like their right. goal. That's Well, that's I mean, part that's of their the lesson. healing. Right? That's part of their healing. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Even just... Like, I know for my type, you know, I don't want to bother anyone, especially uh -huh. if I'm not feeling well. So God forbid I would have to do chemo. There's a part of me that would probably be like, no, 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 I'll have a driver take me, but I just want to do it myself. I don't want anyone to see me like that or be around people when I'm not feeling well because then I won't be at my best or whatever. And so many people just say it's so helpful and important to have someone there holding your hand. It is, it is. You know, and, is. and we talk about that in HEAL, just the research is that social support yes. increases life by like over yeah. 50%. it's dramatic, it's dramatic, yeah. 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 Um, so on that same thing, and this could be a total far out there idea, but just, just some of the spontaneous healing, um, you know, stories that I've heard, one guy, was sent home to die. Is this, um, he was actually a Chinese man, uh -huh. st terminal st stage four cancer. And um, he started playing his violin again, uh -huh. and he started uh -huh. watching the sunrise because he just wanted to soak up life and do the things he enjoyed. Yeah. He, yeah. One of the things was like, he just made sure to drink clean water. And um, he had this vision that like, cancer cells are his human cells. Yes, they, they are. are part of him. Yes, they are. And they are isolated, uh, just uh, like they go uh, AWOL, right? They're cut off from that community. Yes. And then yes. they become, you know, a little bit of a terrorist. Um, and, and you see this with people in society now doing really awful things, and they're mentally ill. They're isolated. Yeah. They're, yeah. So I feel like there is some correlation between the isolation that's a precursor to disease and dying in, in humans, and then also on the cellular level, the human cells that are isolated and then become this terrorist. And, and so part of this guy's recovery, I, I can't remember his name, but was really just visualizing and loving his cancer cells and really embracing them, you know, whereas the Western model, we just want to kill, yeah, kill, right, kill, attack. Right, right. So I thought that was such a beautiful yes, story, yes, and I wonder if you have yes. any thoughts or insights about that. Well, it, it sort of reminds me of... If you want to be an integrated, healthy, whole person, you have to embrace your shadow. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and not reject anything, right? You have to actually digest the food that's on your plate. Mm. And so um, understanding that, in truth, a cancer cell is your cell mm -hmm. that went haywire. It's part of you. And lost its way. And so uh, that's a really different relationship to slash and burn you know, and rejection and push away, you know. And so think of the difference in the state that you're in when you feel open, loving, and accepting to whereas you feel frightened 
and you have to get rid of something. Mm -hmm. You can't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you just, your body, it, you, the tension in your body, your breath, your heart rate, but then your stress hormones. Stress hormones have such a huge impact on our immune capacity. And that is really what we have to fight cancer with. That's what we have. Are there any new, like, are, what's your idea about, or opinion about immunotherapy? Because on, in, in principle, it sounds amazing where it's, yeah. it's, it's drugs that boost our immune system well, to fight. So. it's very uh, idealistic and, and magical thinking dangerous. <laughs> so what immunotherapy is, it's, it, the word immunotherapy is an umbrella for a number of methods and techniques that have been developed to... Uh, the immune system has brakes on it. And so if you take the brakes off and free up the immune system, it can go after tumor cells. But autoimmune disease is a condition in which the immune system doesn't know how to put the brakes on, right? So the side effects of immunotherapies are autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. And so my opinion is there is great potential because I have seen people be dramatically cured of, of cancers like pancreatic cancer that people die of in six months. We don't know what to do for them. And I've seen people like lung cancer has been transformed by targeted and immunotherapy drugs. Oh. Everyone with a lung cancer diagnosis used to die. And now that's not true. Now that's not true. That's so if you live with a little skin rash in exchange for your life, uh, there's trade-offs for everything in life. So what I've tried to do, because immunotherapies are very new still, and so we're not very skillful with them. And so the idea is to unleash the immune system to go after the tumor cells. But what we want is kind of a, a nice ember coal kind of just a, a comfortable <laughs> yes. warming but some people get a forest fire, forest fire right and so those are the people that get into trouble with it and my experience is that most oncologists all oncologists have no training in autoimmune disease and so they don't know what to do when this happens to their patient because they're not prepared. And so I had a, a, a very wonderful uh, conversation with an oncologist whom I absolutely adore. And we, he was treating, we were sharing a patient whom he gave an immunotherapy to, and she developed autoimmune colitis, inflammation of the colon, mm -hmm. as a side effect. And he kept wanting to give her these high doses of, of uh, prednisone, which is a steroid. And, and I just said, no. And so he gave it to her, and then he wanted to take her right off it. I said, no, you can't do that. And we're going to do it slowly, and then we're going to put these herbs in. And finally, we're going around in a circle of emails. He finally said, just do whatever Nalini says. <laughs> <laughs> Because he realized he didn't know yeah. that I had training in that. Yeah. I knew how to manage autoimmune disease, how to get somebody off steroids. Yes. Right? And so that's why a partnership is so beautiful, collaborative mm -hmm. relationships. My whole mission in transforming the face of cancer care is to create collaborative teams mm -hmm. that talk to each other, that uh, that are know open. that you know if you if you have any kind of mastery over anything in your life you don't do some things well <laughs> you know do that thing really well correct so a really masterful oncologist is amazing is amazing but some of them know what they don't know and some you know will act like they know everything and so that's dangerous mm. that's dangerous in medicine it's dangerous for the patient but it makes you not collaborate also yeah it makes you not listen to your patient, you know? So I, my vision is that there are collaborative teams and that the moment of diagnosis, the patient not only has the best of whatever, they, if they need a, a, an oncologist that has mastery in, in chemo or immunotherapy or they need a really skillful surgeon to go in their brain and take out some small lesion that will grow if we don't do that. So. We need people who are really skilled. And you and I live in LA where there's amazing doctors. There are amazing doctors here who are compassionate and skilled and open and mm. forward thinking and collaborative. 
So that's what I wish for everyone. I have oncologists I've worked with for 30 years. Uh, you know, for right. 30 years, who know it makes a difference. They know it makes a difference. I have oncologists, when they're done doing their part, their, the chemo or the radiation, the immunotherapy, when they're done with that, they say to the patient, don't stop seeing Nalini, mm -hmm. right? Because we know that we can prevent recurrence or just make it be a really long time until mm -hmm. you have a recurrence, and then we catch it microscopic. So your first job when you're diagnosed is to reduce your tumor burden. So you have to figure out how you're gonna do that. If you have to have a toxic therapy, I will help you get through that, protect your healthy ish tissues and organs, and recover. You can recover from these therapies. So you can't recover from death. So you have yeah. to understand it's what, a bit harder. what the stakes are, right? Yeah. You know, but oncologists aren't frank with patients. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned viruses that cause yes. cancer. Yes. I recently had a friend, again, it's just like crazy how many people in my life have cancer, um, went through treatment for throat cancer. Mm -hmm. And he said it was caused by um, HPV. HPV. Yes. Talk to me what you're seeing there. Do you believe in the HPV vaccine for kids? Um, so there are many types of head and neck cancer which can land uh, in your throat, in your larynx, in your tongue, you know, in this region of the body. They tend to be very aggressive cancers, and uh, so we need to jump on them. And the most common type is caused by the the HPV virus, which is actually from having oral sex because it actually lives in your genitalia. And so uh, people who have a lot of oral sex tend to have more head and neck cancer. That's the bad news. Right. And so, um, so the HPV vaccines have been developed, and I'm not a big fan of them. But we have a, a culture, at least here, where kids have sex very young. And, and a lot of times they have oral sex. And so we have to be practical. So if you're a parent, you have to look at your kid and uh, figure out what kind of social milieu they're in <laughs> and what kind of, of uh, risks you think they might take and prepare them for exposure to sexually transmitted diseases. And many parents are not comfortable talking to their children about sex, let alone syphilis and gonorrhea and HPV. And it, you know, you, you have to educate kids because they're going to experiment, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. And so how do we prepare them? How do we keep them safe? I am not a fan of the current vaccines, but there's a risk-benefit ratio to every medical decision. So you have to weigh what's the risk of giving the vaccine, what's the risk of not giving the vaccine, right? And so that's about the kid in front of you, you know? But they don't know who their partners, exactly. what, what the behavior of the kids they're experimenting with. It's a non-symptomatic, right? right. You know, STD. So it's very tricky. And so uh, I think that you also need to sit down with a, an open-minded pediatrician and have that conversation. And there's always new research. There's always safer methods coming out. And mm -hmm. so you want to be well-informed and you want to have a physician that will help you as a parent mm -hmm. make a good decision for your child. Vaccines aren't inherently good or bad. They're a tool. Mm -hmm. And so you have to Really, I'm a fan of individualized decision making in healthcare. And so, let's say you have a kid who is immunocompromised and can't mount a response to an infection. Well, that's a high risk kid. You know, everybody's going to try sex. So, yeah. if you have a kid who's very vulnerable to infection and can't fight off infections, well, well, maybe the vaccine would protect them from a potentially life threatening infection. Yeah. And it's very tricky. It's very, it's tricky. very tricky. Again, this yeah. is so complex, which I love that yeah. you love complex. Um, I'm just wondering, like, as far as terrain is, because we talk about terrain as, as part of your, um, you know, yes. outsmart cancer. Yes. It's, it's creating a body where cancer, in, where cancer cannot thrive. Where cancer cannot <laughs> thrive. It's so good. Yeah. So similar with HPV. I mean, it it's passed around like pepperoni pizza in college. Yes. Like, it's, yes. everybody yes. has yes. touched it at some point. Yes. But 
there's going to be certain people that have HPV showing up on tests that never develop cancer. That's right. That's right. Is that because they have a healthier immune system and a healthier terrain, or is it well, just, again terrain, complex? Well, terrain is um, important to every kind of illness we are vulnerable to. So let's just take infections. So if you have more sugary blood, what do microorganisms live on? Sugar. sugar. So diabetics have more infections because they have more sugar to feed little organisms in their body. So if you keep your blood sugar healthy, you have less infections. You have better wound healing. If you eat enough protein, your barriers of your skin and all the linings of your respiratory and digestive tract are a better barrier. Uh, if you have better hygiene. I mean, one of the best ways to prevent infections is not medicine, but washing your hands, having clean water, you know, washing your food. You know, the public health does more to prevent infections than medicine does, mm -hmm. right? And so if you have just an educated patient that knows how to be more safe, right? Mm -hmm. So with kids, you know, they should wear condoms. You know, they should wash their hands, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it's um, some things are very, very basic, but a person who's deficient in protein will have barriers that aren't barriers, that allow, that have breaks in the barrier and that allow in organisms to invade. Mm. And so uh, good protein status is very important. And uh, when, as people age, they actually need more protein because part of the physiology of aging is we lose our muscle mass and our bone mass and our brain mass, and we need more protein to maintain the mass of our body, yes. actually. And so a lot of older people don't eat much protein, and also kids can you know, have an irregular diet. And so you have to see also, you know, there's a, a, a kind of a fad of fasting these days. Well, a fast is a low protein diet. If you're over 60, you shouldn't do it because you'll just lose muscle mass. Mm. So, you know, you have to be educated to so not everything's healthy for everybody, mm -hmm. right? If you already ha have aged and you've lost a lot of muscle mass, please don't fast, right? <laughs> do yeah. something modified where you're still taking in protein, but you're not taking in a lot of other calories. There's yes. intelligent ways to do uh, to switch your physiology to improve your immunity, like intermittent fasting, where you fast for 13 hours between tonight's dinner and tomorrow's breakfast, which won't cause you to lose muscle mass, but yeah. will cause your immune system to switch yes. into being more robust and will also drop your blood sugar and your insulin and cause you not to get diabetes and to have a more normal metabolism for a carbohydrates. Mm. And so uh, exercise also has such a big impact on immunity and blood sugar. So now we're talking about the basics yeah, again, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? And the percentage of body fat you have determines if you're going to get uh, certain types of cancer because so in the United States we have a lot of obesity and so people have too much body fat well the fat is a is a hormone factory the fat is an inflammation factory and so breast cancer patients if they're obese they're much more likely to recur than a lean breast cancer patient and so there's a moment when someone has finished treatment and they're ripe to change their body Mm -hmm. So body composition changes risk. Um, so I know, again, it's bio-individual, and you kind of named off some of the super cancer-fighting superfoods like turmeric and uh, curcumin and, and the rainbow of foods. But supplement-wise, like vitamin D, um, are there like – a handful of things that just blanket people concerned about cancer or have yes, cancer yes, should implement in their body. Of course. So um, let's just talk about like what would be a foundation plan? Like what supplements would you want to take to have a good foundation? And so the way I think of them is like what are the nutrients you need in your your and the ground and then what things are targeted to, to cancer. So probiotics, number one, we all need a healthy microbiome. And you can eat fer fermented food in your diet. And it's just a condiment, you know, a teaspoon of sauerkraut or yogurt or kimchi, something fermented. All, all traditional uh, foods have something fermented. Every culture has some kind of fermented food. Yes. 
I mean, cured olives are, are fermented food. You're looking for healthy bacteria to inoculate your gut, right? Eating a high fiber diet gives those healthy bacteria fuel to colonize in your gut. So having a plant strong diet is very important. So you want to have a multivitamin that has methylated B vitamins in it. And if you have cancer risk, free of iron, free of copper. And if you're a menstruating woman, then you need some iron and you need to not have excess iron. Okay? That's because cancer cells use copper and iron for their own growth. Mm. If you're uh, done with menstruation, you don't need iron. Men don't need iron. Okay? Then you want to have some vitamin C. What we have learned in, in more recently is that taking high doses of vitamin C actually is not very useful. The gut can absorb about 500 milligrams at a time. Mm. So if you want to take two or 3,000 milligrams a day to boost your viral resistance, to boost your cancer resistance, to make your linings and coverings more healthy, then you take it at 500 milligrams at a time throughout the day. Otherwise, you just pee it all out or you get diarrhea from it. <laughs> Omega-3 fatty acids, very, very important. Not only do they reduce inflammation and blood clotting, which we talked about, but they actually cause cancer cells not to be able to stick together. Mm -hmm. And so what's a tumor? It's a bunch of cells that are stuck together. So the adhesiveness of tumor cells is decreased by having uh, omega-3 fatty acids. About 2,000 milligrams a day is a good dose. And then um, vitamin D is very important. Vitamin D is one of those great multitaskers. It's actually considered to be a hormone. And so hormones are substances that act in many different places in the body. Vitamin D is an immune modulator. So a cancer patient or a person at risk should have a blood level of vitamin D of about 75. Most physicians think 30 is a good number. <laughs> so 75 so, yeah, people, 75. 75 is the latest research, okay. Okay, the latest research. Uh, magnesium is an incredibly important nutrient for every cell. Women tend to be more deficient in magnesium than men do because of our, our hormones and our physiology. Uh, so I like magnesium glycinate. It, it is the form that's the most absorbable. The cheapest is magnesium oxide, but you only absorb about 10% of it. Magnesium glycinate, you can absorb almost 50% of it. So it's significantly different. And so that's very important. So we have a, a multi, vitamin C, omega-3s, vitamin D, a probiotic, and then women need bone minerals, right? So if you're over 35, you need bone minerals. Yeah. And so that's very important so that you don't get osteoporosis later in life. So at 35, you start losing bone mass. Okay. So you need to do something about it. What is that, that calcium? Or? Uh, uh, calcium and magnesium are the, and vitamin D are the main okay. nutrients. And um, soy isoflavones actually are really powerful in preserving healthy bone. So, and exercise is yes. important too. Adequate protein is important. People think it's just minerals, but the collagen that is the matrix of the bone where the calcium gets laid down, you need protein to have healthy bone, not just minerals. So and when really you talk important. about protein, you can get them from vegetables, or is you that animal protein? You can get protein. A gram of protein is a gram of protein. So you can get it wherever you want. We do know that red meat is actually much more carcinogenic than any other protein. It may be that it's high in iron. Iron is a, a pro-oxidant, and so it damages cells and DNA more readily. And that's why we also withhold excess iron. Um, vegetarians have less cancer than meat eaters. But I don't ask all my patients to be vegetarians. It's it's harder to do, and since I'm asking patients to eat low carb, it's really hard to eat a low carb vegetarian or vegan diet. So I say plant strong. Plant strong is best, so most of your food is plants. And you're, if you eat some animal protein or fat, it should be really clean, right? Yes. But, but let's go back to the supplements. So um, there we have our foundation. Then I like to put in some targeted things. So what about your immune system? The absolute best thing for the immune system are the wonderful Chinese medicinal mushrooms. And you can find combination products, or if you're just gonna pick one, people are very familiar with reishi mushroom, which is a nice choice because it's super anti-inflammatory as well. If you have autoimmune disease, you can't take too many immune stimulants. So Ganoderma is safe for people who have autoimmune disease. So that's reishi mushroom, Ganoderma. Yeah. About 
uh, 3,000 milligrams a day is a therapeutic dose. So we have to understand there's a difference between a nutritional dose and a therapeutic dose. So if you need to move the needle and change your body and change your physiology, you need some guidance on dosing. Okay. Okay. Don't just read the internet. Dr. Internet is not a reliable physician, <laughs> so don't do that. And then we talked about curcumin, not turmeric, curcumin. Okay. You can cook with turmeric and make your kitchen spice shelf a uh, medicine chest, but uh, you can't get a therapeutic dose of it. Okay. Right? So uh, uh, curcumin is great for the brain, for the heart, for the blood vessels, for the joints, for cancer. So if you take uh, about 2,000 milligrams of curcumin a day, that is really a, a gift to your whole life, to so many facets of your health. You need to have it with a little fat or oil. Think about Indian food as always with ghee or coconut oil. So if you take curcumin, make sure you have something that has a little oil, but that could be your omega-3 fatty acid that you take it with. So that could be simple. And so that's enough right yeah. there. If we want to add one more thing, we might think of resveratrol or green tea in the you know, universe of cancer, or you could just drink green tea every day. The EGCG is the main phytochemical that's in green tea, but it has many other phytochemicals in it that change cancer physiology, change uh, the amount of oxidative stress and damage from free radicals. Also, it helps you be more lean. So I love plant medicine because it's always multitaskers, mm -hmm. unlike drugs, right? Yep. Plants bind to multiple receptors. Resveratrol is the only phytochemical that has hardcore, well-accepted research on actually keeping your telomeres longer on your cells, which is as you age, your you, these tails of, of proteins start to shorten, and that tells you your life is being shortened also. So resveratrol actually is an anti-aging phytochemical, but it also is anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-cancer, lowers cholesterol. It's great for your brain. So a lot of the things um, that stress causes a, a damage to this thin membrane, the blood-brain barrier, and then our brains get inflamed too. And so that throws us off. And so things like uh, antioxidants protect us. Melatonin is a super nutrient for cancer and for the brain. And so melatonin uh, improves viral resistance, proves cancer resistance, helps your brain age more slowly, protect your vision, protect your hearing. Mm. So if I have a patient who has a, a treatment that might damage their nerves, I'll include melatonin in their protocol. There's a lot of research on melatonin in breast cancer compelling research so there's it's a big toolbox yeah you know how much time do you have i know so, <laughs> exactly well right but those those are the big levers right so the lifestyle factors but especially lowering your blood sugar and your insulin huge huge control of cancer development and progression and having a, a baseline supplement plan that will keep you well for a long time um, and then we'll we'll wrap up here. But I you 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 practice acupuncture. I do, and have for many years. What is the benefit of acupuncture with cancer treatment? So acupuncture is one of the most elegant therapies that I know. It's I love simple. It. It's profound. And really, truly, anything you would go to an internist for, acupuncture can address. And so, in the cancer context, we have so many things. People are anxious, so it calms you down, helps you sleep. If you're going through menopause because of a surgery or treatments, it helps with hot flashes, it helps with digestion, it helps with inflammation, it helps with pain, helps with immunity. So again, people think of acupuncture in a very narrow way, but it actually is a, a very broad therapy, and it's it's so simple. For example, a lot of cancer patients will have their blood cells be depressed by drugs, and so you get anemic, low red blood cells, or low white blood cells, which puts you at risk for an infection. There's actually a lot of research on an acupuncture point on your leg called Susan Lee, stomach 36, and if you warm that point up, there's a warming therapy in in acupuncture called moxibustion, but you could use an incense stick. So I teach patients how to warm up that point 
if their blood cells are low. And so you can keep your blood cells from crashing by doing moxibustion therapy on this point, on yourself, at home. So I have a little handout. I describe to patients how to do it. And so they can do that between treatments. And so that makes such a difference in how you feel and your risk of infection, but also how wonderful to feel like you could change the trajectory of what's happening to you mm, by some charming. simple thing. And then it gives you this feeling like you are part of this, this congruent system of nature. And nature knows how to solve things. You know, If we observe nature, we can figure out solutions. And that's what modern medicine fails to do. Why they get lost, right? Why they don't have a health plan for cancer patients. So if we observe nature, we understand we're part of nature. We understand we can transform ourselves. We can transform our bodies. We can transform this cancer terrain. Then we can go from being ill to healthy. Ah, it's so beautiful. If we observe nature... Nature has all the solutions. It does. It's that's, a map. That's what it's ancient wisdom and Eastern mm -hmm. medicine and mm -hmm. all of these, you yes. know, it just, oh, yes. it's the combo is the key. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I know you have a gift for um, I do. the listeners. I do. So the one of the questions I always get asked is, what supplements should I take? Yeah. Which is what you asked me. So I have put together... The supplements I recommend at every stage of the cancer journey. So if you would like to download that as a free gift, it's at integrativecanceranswers.com, integrativecanceranswers.com slash heal. And you download it and start using the supplements and changing your life. Yay. And, and get your book. 32. 32 ways to outsmart cancer, how to create a body where cancer cannot thrive. Boom. I, that's, that's a book I want to read. <laughs> um, well, thank you so, so much You're for welcome. coming on and sharing your wisdom. And I'm just so happy that you do the work you do because I refer so many people to you. <laughs> Sadly, you. I refer way too many people to you. Um, so thank you again. You're most welcome. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.